We came into possession of this uh, gun uh, in 2017. This handgun has been in a police evidence locker for more than five years. It's a Taurus PT740 Slim, a subcompact semi-automatic pistol that fires a 40 caliber cartridge. Small in size, but its consequences immense and irreversible. It's been a hard week for friends and family coming to terms with what happened. On June 14th, 2015, in London, Ontario, 18-year-old Jeremy Cook was shot dead while trying to retrieve a cell phone he had left behind in a taxi. Using an app, he tracked it to a Tim Hortons parking lot where police say he found three men in a car. An altercation ensued. The men started to drive away. And police say when Jeremy tried to hold onto the car, one of the men inside shot him. I just, I couldn't even believe it. Like, it still just seemed like it, it, things don't happen. You know, like, Jeremy was a good kid. So was Lee St. Ross. She was just 14 years old when she was killed in a Toronto community housing complex a month later. She died. Yes. She died. <laughs> it happened in a friend's home. A 13-year-old boy pulled the trigger in an accidental discharge. A 40 caliber semi-automatic handgun was retrieved by police. People knew about this gun, it didn't just show up, it came from somewhere. And now we know where. Ballistics testing on the gun recovered where Lee St. Ross was killed, matched shell casings found at Jeremy Cook's murder scene. Ballistics are much like fireprints. When a round leaves a gun, uh, the barrel leaves very distinctive markings on it. One single gun used in two unrelated murders. A trace done by the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives, also known as the ATF, reveals it was purchased in Michigan by a man named Jermaine Michael Welsh. U.S. court documents obtained by Global News say Welsh's actions resulted in 33 guns being put out on the street. They describe how Welsh, a Canadian citizen, along with several co-defendants, purchased more than 100 guns over a period of five months. Among those recovered in Canada was a firearm involved in a shootout with police during a homicide investigation and the gun that killed Jeremy Cook and Lee St. Ross. According to the ATF report, that gun was purchased from a licensed dealer 385 days before it was taken off the streets. That person is responsible for those two deaths, just like the person who pulled the trigger, as far as I'm concerned, because they purchased that firearm knowing that they were giving it to someone who was going to smuggle it across the border. Well, here is where it all started, in Taylor, Michigan, about 20 minutes outside of Detroit. We now know that the Taurus PT740 Slim was purchased on June 20th, 2014, at a gun show at the Gibraltar Trade Center. That building has since been demolished. But in a country where citizens have the right to keep and bear arms, you don't have to look far. There are gun shows every weekend in Michigan, and about 4,000 licensed firearms dealers scattered throughout the state. And getting your hands on a gun, even as a Canadian, isn't that hard, if you're willing to lie. Take me through the process. Someone walks in here and wants to buy a gun. If you're in for a long gun, you have to be 18 years of age. You have to be a resident of Michigan. You have to be a citizen of the United States. What about handguns? Handguns, you need to be 21. And we're going to execute some paperwork to make sure that your gun gets registered with the state of Michigan. The paperwork involved in buying a handgun in Michigan involves a form which asks if you're an American citizen, if you're the actual buyer of the firearm, if you're a convicted felon, and if you're not flagged in the FBI's instant background check system, the gun is yours. How easy is it to lie on that form? Very easy. I have no, I have no way of knowing if you're being truthful or not. People are really good at duplicating identification now fraudulently. I mean, I've seen some driver's license, you would know the difference. American authorities call it lying and buying, and it can be even easier at gun shows. The rules are more relaxed for private sellers who aren't officially making a business out of buying and selling guns. I suppose if it's citizen to citizen, there's no background check being conducted. Now, if I happen to know you're a felon, then it's illegal for me to transfer you a gun. But how would you know that? I would, you'd have to tell me. Straw purchasing is when someone buys a handgun for someone else who is usually ineligible to purchase it. And it's a big problem. 
Data from a U.S. survey of firearm licensees suggests there are more than 30,000 attempted straw purchases every year. Do you think these people who do that understand the weight and the responsibility that comes with the weapon? Do I think they understand what they're doing is wrong? Yes, I do. Do I think they understand the carnage that they're going to cause? I don't. I, I can't imagine that would be worth it, but I think, unfortunately, in the end, the money talks. This is 580. Yeah. What sells for a few hundred bucks in the United States multiplies in value on the Canadian black market. On the streets in Toronto, these would go for about five to seven thousand dollars. I believe that. That's because you can't get them. It's a lucrative business. Last year, the Canadian Border Services Agency seized more than 1,100 firearms, and that is just a fraction of the flow. I love our, our border security, um, whether it's on the American side or the Canadian side. You know, not every car is searched. Even recently in November, 56 firearms in a bag in a trunk of a car and cross a border. The top five states supplying crime guns into the province of Ontario, Ohio, Texas, Florida, Georgia, and Michigan. All of them, except for Texas, are connected by the I-75 highway, which leads right into Ontario. 663 crime guns were recovered in the city of Toronto in 2020. About 85%, police say, are traced back to the United States. I brought uh, samples of the top 10 crime guns that are seized in the province of Ontario. The Taurus PT-740 Slim is the same kind of gun used to kill Ontario teenagers Jeremy Cook and Lee St. Ross in 2015. Why would somebody opt for this one? Well, it's cool, it's easy to use, it's easy to load, and inexpensive. The ultimate price paid in lives lost. We went looking for Jermaine Welsh. He used to live here two and a half years ago. Global News has learned Welsh's brother and co-conspirator, Stephen Durant, was sentenced to 60 months in prison for his part in the scheme. Welsh received a sentence of 36 months probation in Texas for one count of false statement during acquisition of a firearm, or as the ATF calls it, lying and buying. Family members tell us they both eventually moved back to the greater Toronto area. The way I know him, I don't think he was bringing it to a friend of it to get harmed by it. But they're guns. Yeah. So I don't think he was even thinking. Without those guns in Canada, Jeremy would still be alive. Melissa Cook, wearing a pendant containing her son's ashes around her neck, says the people who pulled the trigger are not the only ones responsible. I think we need to find out where these guns are coming from, you know, how they're getting into our country. They have blood on their hands too. Why isn't Jermaine Welsh charged with buying and giving these guns to criminals? In an unprecedented move in Canada last year, Toronto police charged a convicted gun smuggler with criminal negligence causing death after one of the guns he smuggled from Florida was allegedly used in a fatal shooting. The case is still before the courts. I hope that it becomes a common theme and that when you buy a gun at a gun show in Florida, it might cross your mind that, geez, if this gets used somewhere, I could be held responsible. While an additional charge of criminal negligence might act as a deterrent, defense lawyers argue it may not hold up in court. If you then go and charge someone later on with negligence causing death, and you've already factored it into their first sentence, you may be uh, almost not double dipping, but retrying the same case. And there's principles against uh, charging people for the same offense twice. When somebody is killed with a firearm, where should the responsibility for that death stop? That's the million dollar question. It was a trace done by the ATF that showed us the path of a single gun, from its point of sale at a gun show in Taylor, Michigan, to the Detroit-Windsor border, later killing a teenager in London, Ontario, and then another in Toronto. It also told us who purchased the gun to start this deadly chain of events. And without that tracing, there's no way to identify these people. Officials say last year, more than 30,000 guns were seized in Canada. About half are considered crime guns, and ideally, every crime gun recovered would be traced. But right now, Canadian law enforcement agencies are estimated to be tracing just over 10%. Ontario traces routinely. They trace about uh, 2,000 guns a year. The rest of the provinces, they, we, we're still working on them. I think if the government was doing enough, 
then we wouldn't have the numbers that we have out there right now. We can't accept it. Like, how many children are being taken? How many families are being pulled apart? For what reason? You know, there's no good reason. Tracy Tong, Global News.